Welcome to another episode of the Taming Hindrances podcast. As always, my name is Phil, host and creator of the podcast, and I just realized that I need to change my intro because I don't talk about spirituality on the intro, which is one of the big topics I've been getting into recently. Um, I mean, the last, I don't even know how many episodes have been, I mean, at least, you know, including this one, the last eight, if not more, uh, have been about... No, probably more than that. Probably, probably like 20 episodes in. I don't even know anymore. Um, they've been about spirituality. And, you know, so we talked about mental health. We talked about self-awareness at the beginning of this podcast with, you know, the first set of episodes. And then we made this, you know, slight transition into spirituality. And it's just as complicated as I thought it was going to be. The funny part about it for me is... I always break things down from the, I break things down backwards. So, so I usually typically know the end result. I know the end product. I know how to fake it till you make it kind of. I know how to reverse engineer, if you will, the results into something. Um, I did it with my martial arts career. I did it even with my, uh, I continue to do it to this day with my uh, body work practice uh, in that career. Even with this podcast, I knew I wanted to sound, you know, like a, like a professional podcaster. I, I wanted to use my public speaking ability to kind of orate and to, to speak in that regard. But I also knew that I, I always knew I wanted to get to the spirituality thing. And I, the reason I wanted to get to it, because it, it means something to me personally, I have never really understood my spirituality. I've been tossed between all sorts of different understandings. I've researched and studied religions. I've gone to churches. I've, you know, I've experienced other people's cultures, which I consider spiritual, uh, spiritual practices. I've done everything I can to, uh, maybe I can't make that statement because there's still more I can do. I've done a lot to open myself up to, different understandings to all in hopes that I would find my own to come to some sort of conclusion for myself. And I'm quickly coming to grips with the idea that that might not actually happen for me. In fact, part of my spiritual journey is the journey itself is the trip of the fool through the, you know, the tarot deck as I've been using recently to come up with my topics of discussion. And today was a, whew, today was a, uh, it was a tough one because I, I picked cards and they were telling me this thing and that thing. And I, I was, it was kind of all over the place. And then I finally picked one last card. Um, they kind of brought it together and also gave me kind of a moment of, you know what? In the same way I'm asking for the cards to give me a topic to talk to my listeners, I'm also, I need to reflect that. I need to take that topic as something I probably need to look at for myself. So to get into today's topic, we're going to talk about ego or ego, you know, however you want to say it. But we're going to talk about ego and I'm going to talk about how the cards got me to that because I think it was a little bit convoluted, uh, but they got me there. So and I, I realize now why they did that, um, specifically right in this moment as I'm talking about it. The cards that I picked were a little bit varied, but also poignant, but they each bring up a specific lesson and also question, which that's kind of what the tarot cards are supposed to do. That they're, Each one is designed to add to the story of the fool traveling through the major arcana and learning about themselves and, and then eventually, you know, becoming in a, not an enlightened, but an aware individual. Maybe some people would call it an enlightened individual, but becoming themselves. And this is the process of learning about our ego. It's, it's the process of self-awareness. It's the process of understanding mental health. It's the process of understanding our spiritual selves. It's the process of understanding these three health bodies and their interplays. So I always talk about how we have the physical body and we have the mental body and we have the spiritual body. This is the story of that. This is the expression, if you will, of what that looks like. So before we get into the definition of ego, and I'm going to bring up a bunch of words today, actually, we're going to, we're going to jump around a lot. Cause again, these cards are really kind of picking out specific things. I think bring up a, 
a complex way to look at something that's both complex and also simple. And when we find complex and simple things, we have a duality, which means we have a trinity. So we have to look at what's the what's the coin in this in this statement. And the coin here is ego. It is ego. It is I. It is self. Because that represents the totality of the three health bodies. But it's the version in which we live with and express um, in our, our psyche. It's it's the dictionary, if you will. When I talk about how the mind is the the conversation point or, or the translation point, it's the dictionary, it's the thesaurus, it's the encyclopedia. This is ego. This is that. Your ego is your library for the conversations and the research and all these other things between your spiritual self and your physical self and your mental self and, you know, all of the interplays there. So the, uh, the cards here, I think we'll go through one at a time um, and we'll come back to ego as a definition because there's some, there's some ones I want to get to before that. And the first one, let me make sure I get this in the correct, correct order here. Uh, the first card that I picked or, or came out of the deck was, um, again, I don't pick, I do a shuffle method and then the cards kind of fly out sometimes. Um, the first one was the nine of wands and the nine of wands in this deck, uh, is depicted by this woman who's got her wand, um, you can get a wand sometimes look like spears and she's got this, this wreath of flame above her that she seems to be wielding. Um, and she's standing on eight other wands and those wands are sticking out of the water and almost like, you know, everyone else is sunk and here she is still fighting. Everyone else has fallen and here she is still fighting. And that's the representation of the nine of wands. The nine of wands is a card that tells us there's still a fight. Something, there's still some sort of fight. There's some, some sort of, you know, battle. And it's, it's one that, is ever present and can just continues to happen over and over and over again. It's a cyclical idea almost to the point that it's sickening. It's just like this keeps happening over and over again. This cycle just keeps happening. And I just keep having to fight these battles. So it's a warning of that. It's like, yeah, this is coming back around. What are you going to do this time? Is kind of the question there. And that's, that's the question of virtue the word here that I get from this is what's the virtue here. And, and the definition for virtue can Miriam Webster's dictionary is always uh, conformity to a standard of right. That's your moralities, uh, particular moral excellence, a beneficial quality or power of a thing. Um, it goes on and on here, but these are, these are the things we're willing to fight for. Essentially our virtues are the things we're willing to fight for. So that's what this card represents. The nine of wands is like, yeah, you're going to have to fight the question is like, is this worth fighting for? Or is it time to find a different method? Is it time to like, let this one die or move on from this fight? Is this fight just eating up your time? Or the vice, the, the other option of that is like, should you, know, maybe you should be fighting for this. Maybe these are virtues of yours that you have the morality and the, you know, the ex ethics and you should be fighting for because you believe in them that much. So that's kind of the questioning of that card. And then from there, I went into, um, it's the four of, of coins. And the four of coins is, well, it's kind of a, a statement of like, yeah, you know, wealth and abundance should flow. Like, you know, that resources flow. Resources, they come in and they go out, you know, and it's, it's cyclical in that nature. But we got to monitor them. Um, so the, the four of coins is kind of like, okay, yeah, like, you know, resources might be flowing, but is it time to like conserve a little bit? You know, should we be saving some? Should we put, be putting something aside for a rainy day? Do I need to pay more attention to these resources that are happening, coming in and going out? And this is where um, the word merit comes up to me. Um, and the definition of merit is a praiseworthy quality or a virtue, right? Uh, it's a character or conduct character or conduct deserving reward on honor or esteem. Uh, we're going to come back to that esteem thing a little later. The qualities or actions that constitute the basis of one's desserts, you know? So again, like all of these kind of definitions are hitting on, or let's, uh, we'll use one more real quick. 
the merits, the plural merits is the substance of a legal case apart from matters of jurisdiction, procedure, or form, individual significance or justification. So the four of coins is kind of like, you know, what's the merits here? You know, if, if the nine of wands is fighting for virtue or is virtuous, the four of uh, four coins is kind of like, well, what's, what's the measurement structure here of what do I need to be putting aside? Like what's worth that fight? Essentially, that's kind of the question here because if it's worth that fight, you either need to get up and fight for it or you need to kind of savor it, you know, put it, you know, do the dragon build your hoard and, you know, not squander, but um, the opposite of that to, to hoard that, to, you know, kind of put something aside for a rainy day. And, you know, I know I'm using monetary value uh, vocabulary here, but more like think of when we talk about ourselves, if you're willing to fight for something, then shouldn't you be building that, like that structure inside of yourself? Like, shouldn't you be, considering what that looks like to have have reserves of that like even if it's just energy like if i'm willing to fight for something and remember last episode episode 49 i talked about passion and passion means to suffer for be willing to suffer for if you're passionate about a virtue of some sort or a virtue you want to carry shouldn't you put a little bit of that aside save some energy to make sure you do that you know if you want to get healthy, right? If you want to be fit, if, if that's like something that you really want, if it's something you maybe even really need, shouldn't you be going to bed a little early to have that energy to get that workout in the morning or be able to do it after work? You know, those little ideas are what these questions are, what these cards are questioning. So if you're willing to fight for something, you should also be willing to save it. You should be willing to put it aside or, reserve some resources so you can fight for it if you need to. And when I'm talking about this, please also keep in mind the fight might be inside of yourself, right? That that's, that's a possibility here. We are talking about ego overall. Our overarching subject is ego. So the fight might be with yourself for yourself against yourself, those kind of things. Uh, the next card up was the two of wands and the two of wands is depicted by an individual holding two wands and has the world in their lap. And that's kind of the representation here is there's hard choices that need to be made, but the world is your oyster. Um, and if those decisions are made really kind of, no matter what way you make them, as long as, as long as you're making the decisions from that standpoint of the, you know, the, the nine of wands and the, and the four of coins in this case, but overall the two of wands is a statement of no, as long as you're actually taking the action and making the decisions, not being lazy, the world's your oyster. Things will come of it. Typically you could weigh those as good things. Uh, there will be positive outcome, Th those types of things. That's, but those haven't happened yet. The two of Wands is almost a patience idea. And the word that it brings up to me is value. What is the value of the situation? What value have you built inside of this, you know, realm of what am I willing to fight for? What kind of resources can I conserve so that I can be able to do that? And then on top of that, what, what might come of that? as soon as then I do act. Those are kind of the questions here. So we have virtue and merit and then value and value is the monetary worth of something, but that's just one, like that would be like, you know, fair market price, those types of things, but there's also a fair return or equivalent in goods, services or money. So there's an exchange here, right? Relative worth, utility or importance. I think that's a, that's probably the one that's best to look at. Um, Relative worth, utility, or importance. That's kind of the two of wands idea here is what is the relative worth, utility, and importance of all this? Because I'm going to have to make hard choices. But once I do make those, there will be a return on investment almost. You know, it, there will be something to show for that. And then the last card uh, that came up for this particular thing, I did pick a fifth card, but we're going to get into that separately, was the nine of coins. The nine of coins is the representation of, yeah, 
she did it. You know, that's kind of the definition here. So the nine of coins is depicted by um, this woman with the sun, the sun shining behind her, you know, like a glowing light behind her with, you know, uh, bushes full of coins and, and, and grapes. And she's got a, a nice elaborate dress on and she's like doing the Disney princess holding up a bird. And it's just like a beautiful scene of like, this woman is clearly standing in her power and also representing like, yeah, she made her decisions. This is the outcome. She now gets to live in this world that she created for herself. That's, that's the nine of coins is you made the hard decisions. You represented yourself. You had virtues, you had merit, you built value. You understood and defined the value for yourself. What that actually looks like. Not just, maybe it wasn't just, monetary wealth maybe it was or monetary value maybe it was wealth overall you know you had a, a you know strong familiar or family connection maybe you got a fucking cat i don't know like just whatever that looks like to you you got there you built that you did it and then you get to live that that reality you get to live in the idea that yeah you built this you did this you made the decisions and it came to a fruition that word um is esteem. The the nine of coins represents esteem. And the definition of esteem is the regard in which one is held. This person is holding themselves in high regard. They have self esteem. Um, The archaic definitions of esteem would be worth and value, which, you know, we kind of already talked about also opinion and judgment. Those are the archaic definitions. The verb esteem is to set a high value on regard highly and prize accordingly. This is that that's the representation here. You did it. You made the decisions. You lived your life. You, and not just like you, like you're not the, it's, this is not a card that represents the end of a life. And this is the measurement. No, this is a card that measures like the point at which things get good. You know, oftentimes we harp on young, younger people in society and we tell, you know, we, we always say like, oh, you'll understand when you're older. Well, um, unfortunately, if you are in the part of the younger crowd, I hate to tell you, but I don't really hate to tell you it's fucking true. You're going to get to a point in your life where, um, you realize everybody else was right and it pisses you off and you just have to deal with that. That's also part of this ego thing. That's kind of what these cards are talking about. If I had to sum these cards up into a representation, it's the moment where you sit back and you go, damn it. They were all right. I do like foods that I I didn't ever think I was going to like. I do have, you know, a decent job, a comfortable home, you know, maybe like a, not a, like a, not a fucking sports car, but like, you know, a, a reliable transportation vehicle that gets me to and from. It's not terrible. It's nice. Got AC in it. Like it's that point kind of where you make, uh, you get to say like, yeah, I made it. And that's different for everyone. And it's a decision to say that for you individually, you have to get to the point and maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you're on your way. Maybe you have gotten there. It's that point where you kind of sit back and go, yeah, okay. Everybody else was right. I'm, that's fair. I, they knew. And now I know that, no, I would have never gotten it when I was younger. When, you know, little me would have never been like, oh yeah, like I'm going to do this, this, this. It's the mystery of life in some regards. It's, it's the, where did you come from? How did you get here? It's the story. It's the, it's the how, what, where, when, who. It's not the why though, because that's where ego comes in. Remember, why is a spiritual question? So we, to wrap it all into one thing, we have to talk about ego and these cards. I, to be honest, I just was like picking out definitions individually and trying to come up with an overarching topic. And I thought about purpose at one point, but I had already done a purpose episode. So clearly this was not supposed to be the purpose episode. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to pick one final card. And the final card I picked uh, was very fitting and it really keyed me into ego. I had thought about entitling this episode value and talking about, you know, the differentiations of values and how that all comes again and then bitching about monetary value and going off about the Federal Reserve and how it's all bullshit. But that's that's a topic probably for another discussion, although uh, if you feel up to it. It's really good to understand what the Federal Reserve is if you live in the United States of America or abroad, really, to be honest. Um, Understanding the printing of money and how it 
devalues things and n values things at the same time and how banks work is a really important thing to understand as far as understanding how money works and what the difference between money and wealth actually is. Uh, money is how we value something. Wealth is how you value something um, is a way to think about that. And on my website, uh, on the archive, uh, timmyhendricks.com slash archive, there is a link to a really good representation of what's going on in that situation. Uh, Frontline put out a piece on the Fed. It's called Frontline the Fed. Um, so I think it's about an hour and a half long. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting, um, and well worth the time to sit through that piece and learn about what the fed is. It, it, the federal reserve is not a part of the federal government. Um, it's also not a bank. Uh, they have no reserves. <laughs> the whole naming scheme is to a, a giant lie. There's no reserves and it's not a part of the federal government. It's not a reserve and it's not federal. So there's that. Um, Anyway, going back to our topic here. So again, nine of wands, four of coins, two of wands, nine of coins. What what does your self esteem look like? Um, how did how does it come about? Where does it get built? And the story that goes with it, right? And so I pulled one last card, and the card that came up was the fool. And the fool is the beginning of the tarot deck. It's the first arcana. It's it's the beginning of the story. We have this fool, and this fool is in is carrying all of the things that go into the te- the deck in poor fashion. Um, so they they are carrying a wand, but it's really just a stick. It's not a wand yet. It's just it's just a walking stick, but it's like a wand. You know, they have a pack on their back. It could be full of who knows what. Um, you know, in this depiction, they're, they're, they're dressed like almost like a court jester. Uh, they have a trusty companion with them that is, you know, they really should be paying attention to overall, but they have some sort of representation of all of the things that make them who they are. They just don't understand what they are yet. And so the fool goes on the journey through the major arcana and learns about themselves, right? Well, what does the fool represent here? The fool represents what we start with. We start with I. We start with ego or eagle. That is I. So the definition of ego, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, the self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world. It is the separation. It is the definition. It is the representation of I, of you. I represent it as uh, your depression. I say, I say ego is your depression. And I'll steal this from Alan Watts. Also on the archive, you can go uh, check out a link to Alan Watts's work. He was a... Um, British, I don't want to call him an expat, um, but I think he came over to America for a while. But um, Alan Watts was a, a British philosopher who went to the East and learned Zen Buddhism and, and and all sorts of things Buddhist by nature and then kind of deciphered it for the Western mind and, and gave amazing speeches and talks about uh, what he learned there and then brought it back and again disseminated it amongst the Western population in a way that made a little bit more sense to them. Uh, he was a, a wonderful speaker. He's really you know great to listen to. But stealing something from him, he always said, or always said, um, the most egotistical thing you can do is to try to eliminate the ego. You know, that that's the most egotistical thing you can do. So Stop looking at that option and start looking at the other measurements or values or virtues or merits. Uh, the other esteem methodologies. So we have the self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world. And that builds self-esteem. You know, that's where we get self-esteem for is from. So essentially esteem is the regard in which one is held self being the self version at the confidence and satisfa- satisfaction in oneself that builds self-respect um, now I'd be poorly judged probably if I didn't mention, um, in modern society, we have ego is typically used in a psychological setting. So the, uh, one of the definitions here is one of the three divisions of the psyche in psychoanalytics theory that serves as the organized conscious mediator between the person and reality, especially by functioning both in the perception of and apt- adaptation to reality. So essentially ego would be the measurement point between you and the world 
this is why I call your ego your depression. Because depression, as I've spoken about before, is the methodology of depressing something into one's mind. The word depression comes to us from ancient astrology uh, vernacular when a side real body or a body, a, a planet or anything, any astrological thing outside of Earth, um, any side, that's what side real means outside of Earth, would depress itself below the horizon line. It would move and out of sight below the horizon line. The sun could depress itself. It's called a sunset. And then once that occurs, it goes into the mental space. Once something depresses below the horizon line, then we need, we must move it away from viewable to imaginable. And I've, I talked about all this when I talked about the imagination episode, I've talked about this in the depression episode. These are just kind of some recap things. Um, if you're new to the podcast, please go check out the recap episode back on episode 42. I talk about all these things in conjunction of one another and how I've came up with all these theories and ideas. So with this depression and ego, I say they are equivalent. They are the same thing. Your depression is your ego. Your ego is your depression. So that's what the full card brought up was ego was this story of the nine of wands, what are you willing to fight for? What are your virtues? You know, what, what beneficial quality or power of thing? What a uh, commendable quality or trait? What do you want to be known for? Right? What is your virtues? What do you want to fight for? What do you want to be known for in that regards? Remember, this is a tale of magic and mystery. And, you know, you, you gotta be a little whimsical about these thought processes. Don't just kind of restrain yourself to, or put yourself in a sci-fi epic or a, uh, you know, Maybe you're into horror. I don't know. Whatever kind of setting. Maybe horror is not the best one to talk about when we come. But the hero of the horror story, if that exists. I don't know. Um, I'm not a big horror person. I don't really understand the genre very well. Um, but what what qualities do you want to be known for, essentially? That's the, the nine. What are you willing to fight for? Four of Coins is the, the, you know, the merit, uh, what is the praiseworthy quality of virtue again, the measurement of this. So the character of conduct, uh, re deserving reward, honor, esteem, what is the thing that makes that up? Like what is the, um, I'm lacking extra words to, I've kind of, I've kind of used up all of them, haven't I? Um, what is, what is that? measurement of that virtue. So we have virtue and merit. What's the merit of the virtue? Like, cause it, it, it begs the question like, mm, do I really want to be known for this virtue? So I've said before, patience is a virtue before it's a learned skill, right? Before something can be a virtue, it must be a learned skill. And that's, that's going back to that nine of wands representation of this is the same fight over and over and over again. Like you don't get to like, just skip out on it unless you really should be skipping out on it. Maybe you shouldn't be holding up this fight. And that's the methodology of repetition is the mother of all skill failure. It's its father. The most, the most successful people are the people who failed the most and just kept repeating the process until it either worked or refining the process until it worked is a better way to look at that. So that's that nine of wands. Like what's the process, you know, to become a good public speaker, you have to go speak in public and fail miserably at it and then learn some valuable lessons. And some of those valuable lessons are have the virtue of being respectful, have the virtue of being sincere, have the virtue of being patient, have the, you know, so you build all these virtues. You don't start with them. And that's again, the story of the fool. You don't start, you start with traits, you build them into virtues. And that's the idea of merit how they become that. And then the merit of reserving and resolve and putting aside some energy to work on those things continuously, have the extra reserves, be able to, you know, bring these things into fruition because you, you, you held back just a little bit and, and watched and waited and then had the resources to make the move when you needed to make the move. Um, that's what we call building a narrative when you're, you know, giving, uh, when you're giving a speech, building a narrative helps, you know, not just coming out and being like, this is what I think you should believe in. And you're all awesome. Cheer me. Awesome. Go. No, it's, it's coming out and like, well, you know, maybe I have a platform. That's probably why I'm here. I, I have some sort of platform to stand on some sort of experience or idea. 
and I'd like to share it with everybody and I'd like you to get a benefit out of it. So I want to build value, right? So I want to, you know, start with some anecdotal stories, engage with the audience in making it prudent to their, their situation. You know, I'm not going to talk about, if I go give a speech about um, self-awareness and mental health to a, I don't know, let's just pick some obscure ones. If I, if I go give a speech of mental health and self-awareness to a group of college kids, say in their second year in a philosophy class, it's going to be much different than the speech I give to a bunch of real estate agents at like a convention they're doing. I need to engage with the audience, connect with the audience, bring up things that are prudent to their lives, their situations, and then teach them in some way that my words have value and they can help them in some way so we can have that connection. And then I get to build what's called the narrative. The narrative looks different for both of those. It's almost like telling a story. Um, so that's, you know, that representation, which leads us into the two of wands. This is value. This is uh, like the decisions are now ready to be made. There is value behind all of this. So now it's kind of like distributing the resources. As I build that narrative, I get to then individually hand out almost like the, the parting gift of like, here's what I learned. Here's the wisdom I can share with you. I built the narrative so it would make sense. And then here's, here's the last piece that you needed. And then you can go do whatever you want, you want with that. It's kind of how I set up these podcast episodes. Now I know my method. My method is a narrative that has a singular point that builds backwards. I know the end topic of every episode. That's why I keep it singular. I keep it a single um, word and I have a definition for that word. I give it to you up front and then I unpack it and then I repack it and hand it back to you. You know, it, it's kind of the process of why makers are so engaging on YouTube or why those explanation videos become so engaging because you know the end result. They show you how to unpack it and then they show you how to put it back together again and repack it and hand it back to you. So you're getting like the gift in the end. Um, this would be like, going to a party, knowing you're going to get a party favor, knowing exactly what that party favor is, but being taught or being led through a narrative in which you made that for you somehow, you know, take time out of the equation there, but that kind of process. And that's the two of wands is, well, we know the end result. Like we know we put the resources away. We know we're fighting the fight. You know, we know, the possibility of outcomes, even if they are infinite, it, maybe it is chaos and it is infinite possibility, but we know they're leaning to one direction. We know we've kind of started that creation process. We've started to give it some structure so that when it gets ordered, when it gets filled up, it'll be close to what we're looking for. You know, this is the thing that we call it in uh, the restaurant industry. It's called mise en place. Uh, mise en place is the French term for everything in its right place. So you do all the preparation. That's the fight. That's the fight. Every cook, every line cook, every chef, every, even the dishwashers, everyone in a restaurant is, you know, as long as they're, if they've done it long enough, they learn mise en place. Um, it's the fight every day. You're going to go do this fight every day. It's the same thing over and over again. Prep, get ready, cook, go home. Like, or serve or, you know, take the order. But there's always this preparation thing. That's the fight. The fight is I'm going to have to prepare for the lunch rush. I'm going to have to prepare for the dinner rush. So I do my prep work, right? That's the fight. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes you don't want to do it. Sometimes you're hungover. Sometimes you're sick, but you do it. You know, hopefully, you know, if you're sick, you stay at home, but restaurant industry, yeah, I won't get into it. Go read Anthony Bourdain's, um, no reservation book. The show is amazing. It was a horrible loss to have lost Bourdain. But um, as far as awareness and, you know, his take on the world was a beautiful take. And um, his representation, he fought against the politics of building a show on these, these television, you know, 
conglomerates that want it to look one way, but he's trying to give a different message. Um, but he got famous for writing no reservations, um, or kitchen confidential, sorry. Uh, which told the narrative of the restaurant industry is there's some things going on. It's, a, it's an interesting read. I, I recommend it. I should put it on the archive. Um, note to self, but that's the fight. That's the nine of wands is to go in and do that fight, get the prep ready, get ready for service. Right. And then the four of coins is the, the little bit extra, like, you know, I'm thinking we might get, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I don't know, like it's a busy holiday weekend down at the shore. Maybe you're at like one of the shore restaurants. You're like, I'm going to prep a little extra. I'm going to, I'm going to put a little in reserve. Right. Or maybe, you know, you pre thought the whole situation out and you're like, I'm going to throw two bottles of water in my fridge real quick because I know I'm going to get slammed at some point. I'm not going to have time. So I'll just be able to crack those chug them and, you know, keep going through my, my night. That's that kind of like four coins reserve method of I'm just gonna put a little aside. I, I know I'm gonna need a little extra. I'm gonna put a little aside now, so I'm ready to do that. And then the two of wands, the mise en place. This is the mise en place. It's everything's in its right place. So when the ticket machine goes off and the orders start coming in, boom, ingredient, ingredient, cook, boom, ingredient, ingredient, cook, plate. Everything's where it needs to be so that there's this flow, there's this method, and and things go smoothly. It's really important things go smoothly in a kitchen. Sometimes on the line, you call it riding the wave. Um, I got that from, you know, or worked with some chefs who were surfers. And they talk about riding the wave where you get in the groove, you know, and, and they're just riding the wave. And that's, you don't want to be behind the wave. You don't want to be in front of the wave. Just get right in the channel, right in the groove. And you just ride the pipe, right? That's... That's how a kitchen runs at its best. When everybody's just a little bit elevated, you get a little nervous, you get a little little adrenaline, but you're keeping it under control. You're not getting what's called buried. You're not going under. Um, you're just riding the wave. And you can only do that when there is mise en place, when everything is in its right place. I promise. I'm bringing this back to ego eventually. Um, so then what happens when that happens? Well, the nine of coins. You get to finish the night, and you're like, Yes. Yes, we did battle. We crushed it. You know, we, 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 we did, we had the mise en place. We made the you know, food. We sent it out. It was great. We got through it. And you get this, this exhalation. You get this, like, uh, this exhale of like, yeah, you get the self-esteem. You get the value. You get the, you know, it all comes together. The virtue, the merit, the value. It builds esteem. Then you get self-esteem from it. You're like, yeah, we did a great job. Knowing, though, coming back to do it tomorrow. But like, I'm ready. I got the experience. I built the virtues, put in the effort. Well, what happens when we do that over and over and over again? Because that's what the nine of coins represents totally. The whole representation there is what it looks like at a life level. Well, that's the story of the fool. That is ego. And again, ego is the self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world. So we have to start asking some questions now. Let's let's talk about the individual pieces and then we'll put them all together. So I'm going to put the cards aside and I'm going to get into my my ego, my mentality, my my methodologies. You know, I kind of already talked about how I will take a narrative and break it apart and then put it back together and hand you a little bundle at the end. Part of the reasoning for that is because there needs to be this thought process situation because that's what ego is. That's what ego is, is this constant narrative in your own mind, right? Um, fun fact, not everybody can talk to themselves. No, not everybody has a mental inner voice. Some people don't hear their own voice in their head. They have to go have a conversation with themselves in the mirror or have a conversation with themselves out loud. That is a thing. Um there are individuals who see more imagery in their minds instead of hearing words or vocabulary. I'm not an imagery person. Um, I'm only, I only get imagery when I'm either in a theta brainwave state doing some meditation or like sleeping or uh, sleep wake cycle. It takes a decent bit for me to build an image in my quote unquote mind's eye, which is one of the reasons I hate that saying when we tell people like picture it in your mind's eye. Not everybody has a fucking mind's eye. People, we have to wake up to that idea. Sorry, I'm really mm, pisses me off because that's what alienates people out of like they think meditation is this bullshit thing. 
because we try to add all this extra stuff. We're constantly always trying to add extra, 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 add, 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 add. The four of coins is telling us not to here. The four of coins is be like, whoa, 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 chill. We got to fight this same fight tomorrow. All right. Hold something in reserve. Hold back just a little bit. Don't, don't pile it on too much. That's building the narrative. You don't want to go too far. You don't want to, you don't want to get in the weeds, uh, as it call it's called in the kitchen. Um, that comes from, a you know, the weeds golfing country clubs. Anyway, you want to build a proper narrative. So let's build a proper narrative when it comes to ego and the three health bodies. What's the ego look like at a physical level, the physical body, right? Well, we have um, physical look, right? We have um, vanity. It would be the, the conversation there. And I, I don't remember. I take the connotation out of almost everything. Vanity is not a bad thing. When in regards to self-esteem, self-respect, if it's building those things, it's probably on the right side of the coin, right? Where vanity goes wrong is in ego. That's why I'm bringing up ego. The self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world. So when your vanity, the way you look, doesn't have anything to do with the way you feel, we have a problem, right? But there's a disconnect. So we've, we've separated the ego from the whole system. Ego is whole system. It's the whole thing, top to bottom, spiritual, mental, physical. So when we separate the other two pieces and we're just left with the physical, now we're outside of the situation. We're outside of the system. We're outside of the ego and we're only applying ego to just physical. So when we do that, we get vanity of like, oh, I'm fat. I'm a piece of shit. And we can't do anything with it. As much as I say, I self is depression. And I say ego is depression. Here's the separation I need to make at this point. Ego is part of the methodology of how we use our depression and how we can balance out the uses of our depression, which is what these cards overall told me. Um, When we look at just vanity of the physical body, we're left with things that lead down a dark, ugly road, right? I'm fat. I'm ugly. There's no self-worth there. There's no self-esteem. There's no self-respect. It's actually a a degradatory process. And then you start looking at other people and like, oh, she's got great thighs and my thighs are terrible. Oh, he's got awesome biceps and I look like shit. Um, You know, we get into all the, the bullshit sexual orientation stuff of like, like, oh, you know, look at their figure and look how hot they are and I'm so ugly and I'm not hot. And, you know, this is all vanity in the poor sense of vanity. There are positive vanities. Every bodybuilder I've ever worked with, I won't say met because I've met some bodybuilders that don't look at it this way and they actually are very, very dark, depressed, not depressed, but everyone's depressed. They, they look at it in a very dark vein. They're, they are, they are using this as their excuse to hurt themselves in some cases. Um, I have experienced those individuals. But the body workers I've, the bodybuilders I've worked with are typically like, this is their expression of their effort. Like this is, they feel good. Like, like, like yeah, fucking look at me. Look at all this effort I put in. I look great. You know, I look so great. I, I'm competing at this level. And they also can fall into that, that competition situation where they do get on stage and they, you know, don't get the result they're looking for. And then they measure themselves against another individual and maybe they give up or quit or it, it's, it's tough. So this is that conversation of, have you separated one of the pieces of the whole away from the group, singled it out and then attacked it? If you did that, you better have had a reason. That's the, the two of wands conversation. Like, okay, like I have the resources. What are the hard, what are the hard decisions I'm making here? You know, what fight am I fighting and why? Have the spiritual back in. Why? Like we, you have to come back to the, to that, the Trinity there. You have to bring it back to be like, okay, well maybe I did look at myself in the mirror. Cause I've done this. Maybe I did look at myself in the mirror and go, man, you fat piece of shit. Look at you. You gotta make some changes, man. You gotta make some. And yeah, it was a dark moment and it was, there was some self-hatred there. And 
the differentiation was when I started using that and when other people start using that in their own self to a motivation, spin it into the positive, push it into the, you know, push it into that four of coins moment of like, all right, I'm going to get to bed early. I'm going to stop watching Netflix till fucking one o'clock in the morning. Instead, I'm going to turn the TV off at 10, get in bed, do some reading and then get up and do a workout in the morning or do some push ups before I go to bed. You know, I'm going to get a shower every day, both morning and night. I'm going to, I'm going to throw in like an extra, like, so I feel like I'm going to eat one extra healthy. When you start to use it for the, the modalities of bettering and getting rid of that image, then it's, it's fully ego at that point. It is the measurement based on other things. As much as we say ego is I, I is also everything. That's the Buddhist mentality of different Buddhist understandings, specifically Chan and Zen have a different methodology for how they look at it. Chan is more, um, everything is, I'm going to get these backwards. I always get them backwards. Damn it. Uh, I'll start with Zen. Cause I think I get that one right. Usually more often than not. Zen is a representation of I am everything. Oh, sorry. I got it backwards. I'm a, everything is a part of me. That's more Zen. Whereas Chan is more of, I am a part of everything. Did I say that right? Probably not. I apologize. Um, I'm losing myself here a little bit. So there's two, there's two different distinctions. There is, I am a part of everything where everything is a part of me. There we go. Chan is everything is a part of me. Zen is, I am a part of everything. So applying that back to ego, this is Alan Watts statement of the most egotistical thing you can try to do is eliminate your ego. The ego is also part of the world. Like you are a part of this world. You are a, a physical representation. You are a mental representation. You are a spiritual representation in this material, in this world that we all live in. So, when we go back to the definition, the self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world, you're a part of the world. You can contrast yourself to yourself. We kind of forget about that. And we start nitpicking at like, oh, I wish I had, you know, her sense of style or, I, you know, I, I wish I had his sense of style or him, her, whatever. I don't get into fucking pronoun bullshit. Um, no offense to anybody about that. It's just, it's it's getting ridiculous and I'm not going to get into it just cause like, it's just, yeah, the people are just spouting bullshit out of their mouth on a regular basis and have no idea what the conversation is all about and just want to make themselves feel good. This is what we call virtue signaling. The only reason I just brought that up was just to get to this topic right here. We call it virtue signaling, right? Let's go back to virtue, right? That was our representation of the, the nine of wands. What are, you know, what fight are you willing to fight? Like, and, and what's the point of fighting it? Conformity to a standard or right known as morality, a beneficial quality or power of a thing, a commendable quality or trait merit. Virtue signaling is trying to make people think, Oh, you're virtuous. Look how virtuous they are when they're not. That is what, that is the definition of virtue signaling. You're signaling to the world that you are virtuous. Remember what I talked about of virtues? They're learned skills. You must practice them. Most of these people haven't practiced them. They're just jumping on a bandwagon. I talked about this in the passion episode. You know, people just jump on these bandwagons for likes, for, for thumbs up, for shares, for to feel important. Why? They lack ego. They lack esteem, specifically of the self. Because they stopped measuring themselves with themselves and started measuring themselves against a world they don't exist in. That is the biggest warning of the story of the fool. That is Alan Watts' warning. The most egotistical thing you can do is try to eliminate the ego. This is the representation against the act of suicide. That if you don't want to be egotistical, you can't eliminate yourself from the world. There is such a thing as virtual suicide. There is such a thing as virtue and merit and moral and ethical suicide. 
there are all of these representations of how one tries to take themselves out of this world. And that's the most egotistical thing you can do. And there's no self-esteem to it because you don't hold yourself in any praise. In fact, you are constantly seeking pity. And what have I told you about people who are constantly seeking praise or pity? Don't trust those people. So these people who are virtue signaling, these people are always anyone who puts on their, and I'm going to get, I'm going to piss a whole bunch of people off about this one. Anyone who has to put him, her, put the whole pronoun thing on a name tag or on their social media site, anyone who has to do that is not comfortable with themselves. They're not. They're trying to take themselves out of the world. They're trying to remove themselves from the conversation by virtue signaling the conversation. You don't let something die by constantly paying attention to it. The reason racism still exists, one of the reasons racism still exists beyond the fact that there's just some fucking shitty ass people out there is that we keep signaling it. We keep bringing it back up. We keep throwing it in everyone's faces. We keep giving it that idea to children. We keep teaching them how to be racist. We should let it die. It should have died a long time ago. And I can't apologize for it getting to this point because there can't be an apology anymore. That would be egotistical. There needs to be a methodology in which we all kind of look at it and go, you know what? It's not a hush hush conversation. It's not a it's not a, a back room conversation. It's a no. There is no conversation. You don't get to talk about that. You don't get to make those statements. You don't get to make racist comments. It's just not okay. It's just simply not okay. It never was. It never will be. It's not okay. That is the answer to, for me personally. That that if someone makes a racist comment around me, I'm going to spin around and be like, yo, fucking asshole, shut up. You don't get to speak anymore. You've lost the right to speak. You need to go home and think about your life because you clearly don't understand anything. That's how you treat that shit. You know, remember, I come from a background, and I, I know I get a little harsh on some of this stuff. I come from a background of martialism, of warfare. I constantly think you're in a state of warfare. In the state of warfare, in the state of war, specifically in the idea of a psychological war, which we're always in, marketing, you know, your interest, put that in a political spectrum as well. Put it in a social spectrum. Anywhere you want to put this, it works. That's why it's principle level ideas. If I want you to continue to do an action, I will bring it to the forefront of the conversation in every possible way I can. Because you're going to start to get annoyed by it. You're going to go back to the nine of wands. Oh, I have to fight this fucking fight again. I'm just getting so fucking tired of this. So you got some options. Maybe you'll give up. You'll just give into it. You'll just let it happen. Or maybe you'll just keep fighting against it, but you'll start to be like, man, am I really ever going to win this? Like, am I ever going to, the way you do that at a psychological level is to constantly make it part of the conversation over and over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. Everything leads to it. Every route, every divisional line they've possibly created amongst the populace all leads back to these functional ideas, but they never do anything about them. Please start watching people's actions. Like I'm, I'm, I'm getting heated. I know, but like this goes and you know, not that I'm going to equivalent these in any way, but this goes to the whole fucking, you know, weather thing like, Oh, global warming, global warming, global warming. Oh, now it's climate change. Because the global warming thing didn't work. Now we got to talk about climate change. Okay, great. Yes, let's talk about deforesting. Let's talk about, you know, like the deserts that are growing because we've cut down all the fucking forests and the terrible shit that we do to this planet. But stop listening to the fucking assholes who are getting on planes every weekend to go talk about it. That are driving around in giant motorcades with, they don't drive EVs. These are giant SUVs laden with bulletproof glass and paneling that makes them almost twice as heavy as a normal vehicle, which requires more fuel. 
those motorcade cars, I'm going to put this in perspective view because some people don't get the jet thing. Let me put it into a perspective you might understand with your car. If your car, let's just use a round number, gets 20 miles to the gallon, the motorcade version of your car, the one that protects the individual inside of it from bullets and, you know, attacks and stuff like that, probably gets 10, if not less. And that's what they drive around in all the time with 10 other vehicles that do that as well. And then they go get on jets and then they, they, their carbon footprint is like a hundred times yours. And all they do is ask you, what are you going to do about your carbon footprint? Do you recycle? They don't fucking recycle. Are you kidding me? They don't recycle. Their aides recycle. Their servants recycle. Like these are the conversations we got to pay attention to people. Like this is what these cards ultimately, if you wanted to pick like a big topic picture of what these cards are asking you, it's asking you like, are you willing to stand up and like take this shit anymore? And I'm not saying go out and riot. I'm not saying go out and I'm not even saying go out and protest. Cause you know, that's, that's your own personal decisions and stuff. And I'm not big on crowds. So, but that's, that's the ego thing. They've eliminated their ego. They've done the most egotistical thing they can do. They've taken themselves out of the world. They don't believe the rules exist to them. And I know I use the word they a lot. These are the powerful elite in the world. This is the government structures. This is, and no, I'm not saying burn it all down. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to be a radical extremist in any way. I just, I want you to look at your ego and decide who's got my best interest in mind. Do I even have my best interest in mind? Like I use this as a play on the macro micro of they don't, I guarantee you the people at the top don't give a shit about you. They never have, never will. So if they don't, are you also not going to? I'll ask you that again. Like if the people at the top, they just, we know they just don't give a shit. Are you also not going to give a shit about yourself? Are you also going to sit there and try to take yourself out of the world after they've already done that to themselves? They've already decided and also done it to you. Not only did they decide that the world, they are better than everyone else in the world and that they deserve better and they are, you know, smarter and stronger and just more important. They've also decided you're not, you're not important. You're not stronger. You're not smarter and you don't deserve to live. That's like, that's the conversation here. So when we talk about ego, we have to have that brutal conversation. We have to talk about the brutality of what we allow children to do to themselves in standardization, in a measurement structure they'll never win against. These are the deeper levels of the conversation people have been hinting at for years. And it's not that they did it wrong. It's they are more powerful than us. They have quantitatives and they have all sorts of, you know, they have legal parties and they have all these advisor groups. This is the idea of lobbying. They have all of these people that are all a group, they're, they're an organized collective that have money and education and power. And there's a lot of them overall, you know, it doesn't take many and there's enough that once the voice picks up and the message is right, they can find a way to, to turn it, to curve it, to stamp it down. They wouldn't be able to do that if people had a representation of their ego. So we talked about the physical, right? We talked about how you could switch from, oh, I'm so much weaker and worse and uglier than everyone else to, I really don't like the way I look, how I feel. I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to do some shit. I'm going to get motivated. I'm going to put in a little bit more effort. Fuck everybody else. I don't care what they think anymore. That steps us into the mental state. 
This is something, you know, I talked about earlier in this episode when I talked about how part of growing up is realizing that everybody else was right. One of the things you learn when you get into your 30s is, fuck, they were right. Once you get into your 30s, you're like, damn, I've stopped caring, man. You know, either you got the kids or you got the job, you got, you got other shit to deal with, right? So when you get into your 30s, you're just like, you know what, like none of that shit matters anymore. I don't need to go out and party and get drunk every night. I don't need to get fucking high and, you know, I, I don't need to do all these things. I need to take care of myself. I need to, you know, you start to look at longevity, you start to look at goals, you start to look at, you know, rent and a mortgage and, you know, car payment. You start to look at your responsibilities. Being responsible for oneself starts in the mind. And that's part of ego. Is to be responsible for your self-image, for your self-esteem, for your, your representation against others and the world, how, how that measurement structure happens. That's a tough game though, right? So like the mind's a tricky place and you can get lost in it and things stop making sense or you can get coerced or get corrupted because you're still missing the third piece. It's very easy to corrupt or coerce or to lead astray or to convince even doesn't even have to be in a negative light. You could, you know, just convincing someone remember how I talked about building the narrative. It's very easy to convince someone who only has two pieces of the picture of a three picture of a three part picture. Cause you get to fill in the third piece for him. It's usually the one that brings everything together. Part of me trying to figure out what spirituality actually means is so I wouldn't be able to be coercible or corruptible in that manner. And I had built a, a negative positive. I had built a almost, it's more of a disregard, but almost a hatred at one point of organized religion. Now I just disregard them, but a wariness, if you will. And that's good. That means you're discerning things. That means you're measuring yourself inside the world of saying like, do I really want to trust these organizations? Um, I don't know. This is how you build a cult. If you want to know how to build a cult, here's your blueprint. Find people who have very little self-esteem, who don't understand the connection between their mind and their body and their body and their mind and their mind and their spirit and their spirit and their mind and their spirit and their body and the body and the spirit. Find one of those broken. It only takes one really. I mean, the more that are broken or they don't realize the easier it is, but one is enough. If you're really good at it to start, you know, getting in there And so you find the people who don't have the connections and then you either break down the connections they do have or you build the connections the way you want to build them. It's partly why I often belittle my statements and I say, you know, like, don't listen to me. I'm just an idiot on the internet or, you know, I say things like do your own research or, and I know people sometimes hate to hear that, but where I I make statements about how, you know, I'm not a doctor, I cannot diagnose or prescribe or that I'm just trying to make you think that I am trying to play devil's advocate, that I am trying to piss you off, that I am trying to get you to come get triggered on the Timmy Hendricks podcast. I say these things because I'm not trying to build a cult. I'm not trying to break up your connections. I'm trying to help you build them. But even then I still don't think you should trust me. That would be the wrong idea. We've never met. You don't know where I'm at. You can't come punch me in the face. You know, like, that's how we, that's how we are corruptible in a personal scheme of this is kind of why I close myself away. And I'm introverted in some ways that I'm only really kind of bolsterous or only very, um, outgoing in my professional manner, because I know I have a basis to stand on. You can't come at me in my professional field. I'm above board on everything. I do my best to serve the community as much as I can. I'm always acting in the interest of my clients. That's, that's what I do. Like I've always built that on my career. I've done it in every single job I've ever had. It's my virtue. It's my merit. It's my, you know, it's my esteem. It's my value. I've always put value in myself of my work ethic. I can just work with complete disregard to myself in some state, in some cases, I can just work, destroy my body, destroy my mentality. I can just work. 
It's a value of virtue and a merit of mine. It, it's the combination. It's all of these things. It's something I'm willing to fight for. I, I fight for the idea of being in service community to community, to working, to going to work, to showing up on time. You know, I talk about how to be a good employee. Show up on time, ready, dressed, with a good attitude and a willingness to learn. It's probably not even that complicated. Just show up on time, dressed, which is ready, good attitude, willingness to learn. Those four things. Home is where the horror is. Leave it at the door. Do your job. And I know that's not, I, I make it sound simple, but like that's just to be the best employee you can be. And you'll get far and people will notice that. Um, but with this ego thing, part of my ego is I just know I can outwork you. That would be me being like egotistical a little bit about it. But like my measurement to the world is, yeah, I can work. I can just work. But I want to do a high quality of work. And so there's other pieces and it becomes multifaceted. And that's what I'm talking about when can't just have the body, can't just have the mind. We also have to have this spirit thing. And because I didn't understand mine, I kind of built a wall there so that I couldn't be corrupted by that. That I couldn't fall into the dogmatic ideas, couldn't fall into the cult-like ideas. Because I've seen other people do it in my life. I, and I had experienced it, you know, having been raised as a Mennonite. Their, and maybe they got to me a little bit because their idea of salvation to them is, is work. Work is your salvation to, to, to be in work for God, to work for God is your salvation. Um, that's the old school Mennonite option. Mennonites are just Amish with electricity. That's a, that's a joke. And I hope, hopefully I pissed somebody off with that one, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's a, it's a kind hearted joke to be honest. Um, they have virtue and they have merit and they have family values. And most of them are sexist and kind of bullshit, but they're getting better. I think, I mean, I haven't been a part of that community in a very, very long time, but when I did leave, they never really wronged me in any way. But anyway, that's what built my stylization of like, mm, yeah, I don't really believe in this organized thing of like, you know, religion. I don't, their picture of God didn't make sense to me. Their, their option of, you know, women serve males is that doesn't, that doesn't seem right. you know, equal ideas. And so that's where the conversation kind of goes for me is because not only can we have ego, but egos can be built of collectives. This is that the self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world. You can't take yourself out of the world. You're part of that equation. So you have to remember that. With that, contrasted with another self. When we contrast ourselves to another self, and I've warned about this in the past on this podcast, we can't allow the decisions to be made for us. We can't give someone power over us because of that. This would also be a methodology of eliminating the ego. We can't do that. That's egotistical. We, wanna, we don't want to do that. So when you give up your power of, of decision or, or even conversation or you give up the ability to even fight, to even do the nine of wands, if you give up your ability to, to save, to put in reserve, to hold back just a little bit, that four of coins, to be aware and to pay attention. If you give up that right of the two of wands of for the world to be your oyster, to be able to make the tough decisions, you'll never get the nine of coins. You'll never get that self-esteem fruition moment of like, yeah, I fucking did it. Here I am. And also with that, the last card here, the fool, if you believe other people all the time when they say they did, they didn't. They haven't made it yet. If you still need to virtue signal, if you still need to fucking tell the world all the time, look how awesome I am. Look how important I am. And that's like what you actually, like you believe you need to do that. Some people do it for entertainment and it's funny and you know, there's com comedy behind it where there's drama, storytelling, narrative, those types of things. But if like, if, if someone's doing that because like that's what they need to do to give themselves that feeling, it's all bullshit. 
It's, they're just lying to themselves and they haven't figured it out yet. Other people have. That's what I talk about. If someone's constantly seeking your praise or your pity, they don't know how to value themselves. And you shouldn't trust them because they don't know how to value themselves. So they are not making their own decisions. You can't trust someone if they're not making their own decisions. They clearly have other ulterior motives or have been corrupted or coerced or someone else is in control of them. That's how you build a cult. Again, going back to that cult blueprint, you break down those things and then you put yourself as the link. That's what cult leaders do. They make themselves the link, specifically usually to the spiritual. They, they make them the link to someone's spiritualness. Pastors, priests, rabbis, not calling them cult leaders. No, I won't make that. Just I will make that distinction. I'm not, but I am drawing that connective line of if you have no spirituality because you only have your religious leaders' thoughts, if that's how you connect to your spirituality, that's not spirituality. You have to define these things for yourself. That's part of being ego. If you let someone else do it for you, you've eliminated your ego from the world. You've eliminated yourself from the conversation. You've eliminated yourself from the process, which means you can't have the connection because you got rid of yourself. I hope that makes sense in some way. Um, how I got to this one with these cards is a little bit of a mystery to me. It was, a, it was, a, it was a long time in coming, I think, but like it, it, this card pick was, it was rough. I was like, what the hell am I supposed to be talking about? So again, ego is the self, especially as contrasted with another self or the world. We can't eliminate ourselves from the world. We're part of it. With that, we have things like virtue, um, a commendable quality or trait, I think is the one I'll use there because that is the definition also of merit and merit is a praiseworthy quality or a virtue. They go hand in hand. They are synonym of each other. How we value that really matters. How we measure that of relative worth, utility, or importance really matters. It doesn't just happen overnight though. It's built. It, it, there's effort that needs to go into it. There's, Attempt after attempt after attempt and failure after failure after failure until we learn. And you know, that's what lessons are all about. And so it is worth repeating ourselves in that nature. It is worth repeating in general because that's what builds esteem, the regard in which one is held. You can't hold yourself in high regard if all you have is one data point. You know, like if all you have is a singular measurement. It's very easy to break down that measurement. Um, you could win the first battle, right? You can get an A on your test. You could, you know, the first test of the semester, you could get a high praise that first um, project at work. So yeah, perfect record, right? It's real easy the next time to, all the opposite happens. It's just shitty and it's bad. That too isn't a measurement. That's not enough measurement there, right? Because they cancel each other out if you want to look at it that way. But like, that's the problem I think a lot of people run into as far as ego goes. This is why we have the things like, yeah, when you get to your thirties, you know, it'll, it'll, you'll just, you just won't care anymore. And you'll be more worried about yourself or, it takes time. It, it takes effort. It takes failure. It takes responsibility. It takes all of these things to build up. So as, this is, again, going back to the fool. This is how I came to the conclusion of ego. The fool starts his journey or her journey or their journey. Whatever, you know, I, I know I piss some people off with the pronoun thing, so I guess I should backtrack just a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, the fool starts with a backpack and, and, a, and a walking stick and a, and a friendly, trusted companion. Uh, it's typically depicted as a dog, but mine would probably be a cat. Um, and they're going on a journey. And, you, know, you know, they have some supplies, but like we don't know what they are. We don't know what our virtues are when we're born. We don't know what our, our value is. We don't know what our, our merits are going to be. We don't, 
We don't know what our, our inherent traits are. We can guess on them. Parents do that constantly. Like, you know, I always looking at their kids. Like, what are they going to be good at? Can I get them into, can I get them into football? Is this my meal ticket here? Like, no, nah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really pissing people off. Right. Um, but like, we don't know, we don't know what the kid's going to be. And yeah, some, you know, it comes out pretty quickly and we get like, Oh, look at their genius or their idiot savant at this or this, that, and the other thing. They're natural. But like that might as well be a lottery of sorts. There are some conversations to say that the, you know, you're born with these inherent traits from past lives. That's the idea of reincarnation, all sorts of things. Right. But we do have these traits, not learning about them, not playing into them, not using them would be a mistake. Another mistake would be not taking inventory again, not measuring twice, cutting once, not making hard decisions to, you know, decide like, is this, is this something I want to cultivate? If this is something I want to continue to do or be better at not having that reflection. That's the representation in the full card with the trusted companion, the, the, you know, the dog, or again, in my case would be a cat. Not having the outside measurement of, yes, I am a part of this world. Because the fool can quickly forget that they have a part to play. That there is something they're good at or should be doing or, or a mission or a, a, a something that they're supposed to do or, or, learn or, you know, it's really easy in modern society to lose self-importance. It's really hard to build self-esteem. We've made everything unnecessarily hard. And again, this goes back to my soapbox I always stand on about powerful elites and assholes and, you know, the banking structure and all the corruption and, you know, and it's easy to think that we'll never win that fight, right? It's easy to think that like, no matter what we do, we're just going to be stuck in this cycle. And that's why I thought it was interesting that I got to where I got with the full card here, but we started with that nine of wands. Cause that's that conversation of like, you know, is, is this really worth doing every day? Is this really worth fighting? You know? And if that's the conversation, specifically when you know I'm stepping back away from the spirituality thing a little bit to go into the mental health side of these cards, because that's where I started this podcast, and I think I need to remember to come back to that now and then. That's a question that can be combated with self-awareness. But if that hasn't occurred yet, it can also be combated with the, the with this methodology. What needs to occur to use that information for your own benefit? Do you need to just take a mental health day? Do you just need to take a bath? Do you just need to make a small change? Do you, I put things in a grand scale quite often, but really minutely at a microcosmic level, it matters to you personally, the way you build your ego and the way you understand yourself. I can just keep trying to put it in different vocabulary to hope that it it just kind of like pops or it, it, it shows up that you can go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This makes sense. Or I'll put this together, that thing and the other thing. So my challenge as far as the ego conversation is what I've been warning you against. What 
What's your world look like when you take yourself out of it? And you're going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you told me not to do that, right? Yeah. Well, here's why I'm asking that question. This is a spiritual thing. Why question? Spiritual thing. If your world doesn't change at all by the idea of you taking yourself out of it, you're not self-aware yet. You haven't built your ego. You don't have any self-worth, self-esteem or importance, but you can, you can, you absolutely can. And the first step to that is, you know, saying you're going to take control of your depression. You're going to be responsible for what's going on in that conversation to insert yourself back into the world. Slowly, carefully. But if you have the conversation with yourself of, if I just remove myself from, from this world that I live in, what changes? If the answer is nothing, then the true answer is not to do that. The true answer is to ask yourself, well, why? What am I lacking? What am I missing? I clearly haven't become self-aware yet. Okay. Well, it doesn't mean I can't or shouldn't. It probably means you need to be responsible for your actions and your mental states and the things you're doing. You need to find a methodology to go about that. It also means that you need to take some time for yourself. It also means that you need to make yourself a little bit more important to you. It means you need to find something you enjoy and do it. So that when you do have that conversation of like, well, if I, if I remove myself from my world, if I try to take my ego out of it, What matters then? Like, oh, fuck, I'm going to miss my favorite anime show. Like, that's not cool. I don't want to do that. That's good enough to start with. Or no one's going to feed my cat. Fuck. Great. Have a responsibility. Um, oh, they'll miss me at work, right? You can use an outside measurement to begin with to start to build the understanding of, oh, wait, you are important. I can tell you why you're important right now. You're one of my listeners. You've listened to this. That makes you important to me. That, that is how the content creation cycle works. As much as I kind of, you know, go against the idea of like, you know, don't you know, go do a little bit more than watch people do it for you. That decentralization of interest, which I think is an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's an important thing. Um, the conglomeration of how that goes about and the, the control structures that are put in the gateway system. Um, of the gatekeepers and all that is, is, is that's bullshit. And again, these are the fights. They're just, they're just constant. We just got to keep fighting. But I don't think people understand sometimes because they're meant not to. Celebrities aren't important unless you exist, unless you think they're a celebrity. Gods aren't gods unless you believe in them. Politicians aren't important if they have no one to represent. Thought leaders can't lead anything if there's no thoughts. Content creators can't create content for anyone if there's no one interested in their content. So like, yeah, the role might be small. You might be fucking... Tree number three, you know, in the background of the play, but like without tree number three, there's just like a, like a blank spot on the whole thing. There's, there's no, there's no ambiance. There's no, there's no little fluff. There's no little, you know, without that barista who takes their job just a little bit more seriously than everybody else, even though they get paid shit money. maybe somebody has an even shittier day because they didn't just get that little extra bit of foam on the top that they really like. And by having that little bit of a shittier day, maybe they fuck up on 
the report they were supposed to do. And then it makes their department look bad and then everybody hates them. And then they have to go home and be miserable because that all happened. And now they wallow away in self pity. So like just that little extra foam on the top from that barista who just gave a little bit more of a shit that day, just cared just a little bit tiny more about their job, had a little bit more respect for the responsibilities Saved somebody from having a shitty day. This is what we talk about when we talk about those little things, the little, you know, things you can do. This is where I take what they want to be the ego, what they want to be. And again, I'm using that big broad word. They to represent the fucking assholes out there who think they're better than you. This is what decentralization creates is eliminating them from the process to be important to our community. This is why I talk about serving the community. That's part of ego. It's to serve the community, be a part of the world. And to understand that, yes, there is importance there. Even though you don't see it, you don't believe it, you know, just a little bit of effort here or there, just that little bit of extra caring or a little bit more, I don't even know. I, yeah. It's it's individual to a person. It's really hard to show someone it, but this is why I believe in chaos so much because chaos is infinite possibility. What does that really look like? Let me use a let me use a a, a narrative that might piss somebody off because that's I feel like that's where I got to go with this. Sometimes it's just to like get people angry at me to make them listen, and that's a shitty way to do it. But at this point, I got to kind of use what's in the wheelhouse. So. Let's talk about, I'll use myself as an example to make it a little bit more personal, a little bit more poignant. I was taught real early on what racism is. I was taught to be racist. That was my upbringing. I was taught, you know, and shown what necessarily, what I I need to make necessary, the point of was bullshit. Um, but like I was, you know, taught that I'm a farm boy, redneck, you know, and you know, Mason Dixon line and like country music. And, you know, I wrapped all that together with this other statements that were being made around me of like racism. And I'm, here's where I make the differentiation. I'm not going to tell you what those were what I heard or what other people said, because it's bullshit and shouldn't be repeated. I'm just making the statement that I was taught what racism was and that I should be it. I should draw dividing lines. I should, you know, I should think certain ways about certain people because of certain qualities or characteristics. it became readily apparent to me very early on that that was bullshit. So too did the idea of this thing we call privilege. I'm not going to put any color differentiations on it because I was lucky enough to grow up as a poor farm kid. I grew up poor. It was the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me to have grown up poor. And then later on, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me was to have to live out of my car for a year, to be homeless for a year. Although I don't really say I was homeless because I had a car to live in. What most people would pity me for, I consider merits. I consider virtue, learning lesson, learning and lessons and character building exercises. The diversity I experience is no, not as great of a diversity as others, but the understanding of what that actually is, is what eventually connected me to the other individuals who were also suffering in that manner. My eyes were open to a greater perspective, specifically then in my martial arts career, where I started to learn other cultures and I learned other just methodologies and philosophies and ways of thinking. There's one right there, philosophy in general. 
And I started opening myself up to that. I did that at a very young age, luckily. So I had all these experiences that brought me to the mentality of no, this thing you keep saying about these people is not correct. I don't know how you believe it. I don't know why you believe it's okay to say that. The problem was I wasn't strong enough and I wasn't smart enough to speak out against it. And that's where I went wrong for a really long time is I, I wasn't able to stand up to it and say, no, 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 absolutely not. Because I didn't understand that I could do that through action. I could just disassociate myself with those people. I could just be like, wait, hold on. What did you just say? No, fuck off. We're done. Nope, not talking to you anymore. That also did teach me, though, at the same time that I needed, some people just needed time to counteract what they were also taught was correct. And this is, this is actually kind of where I get that ignorance is okay, willful ignorance is evil. You know, when people eventually get woken up to the idea of, like, whoa, whoa, hey, whoa, hey, hey, you know, that, that's not okay to say. Like, you can't say those things. You can't even, like, thinking that is wrong. That's just not right. Like, you have no basis in that. It's something that you were taught. And that's, you were taught incorrectly. That's not true. It's not how things are. It's not right. If then they continue to do the action, definitely no. That's, that's evil. But I think there is a line there. And that's part of this conversation of ego. And the questions that I was asking. Because this is what it looks like. I said I was going to build a narrative, right? So we have little me being taught to be racist. Being taught that there was these, you know, these things were cool. Those things weren't blah, 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 blah. So little me gets taught to be racist. Had I not been taught to be racist, I couldn't have learned the opposite. And I understand that's where a lot of people's perspective is coming from. But because I didn't learn the opposite till much later, not much later, probably even before I was a teenager. Um, but without that structure, right? Having begun with, I wouldn't have built a lot of my other pieces of myself around that idea, right? So without the challenge of the ego, I couldn't come to the conclusion later on, oh, wait. The answer in the beginning should have been never to have learned that to begin with. So although we like to build the narrative of like, yeah, you have to suffer. You have to go through diversity. It's not our jobs to build that narrative for other people. It's our jobs to understand our experience. That's part of being, you know, that's part of ego is to understand our experience. That is the depiction of the full card. So yeah, I can, I can weave a, a fantastic narrative of, yeah, I got taught to be racist. So then I could learn not to be racist. And then I could learn that like we do this and then like this, that, and the other thing, or like I could talk about the narrative of, you know, the kid who loses their parents real young. And then because of that, they were able to make a foundation later on life for kids who lost their parents. Those are great stories. And we love, we love great stories like that. We love the underdog story. We love, but what's the point of celebrating those stories? Think about that. Think about what are we celebrating in that regard? We're celebrating having a shitty life, right? We're celebrating being bad to each other. We're, we're celebrating 
the things that shouldn't exist in a modern society. If that's, if that's where we want to go with this, like, no, life is not meant to be easy. I will agree with that statement. Life is not meant to be easy. There's plenty of other things making life hard. We don't need to keep making up new ones just so we can make ourselves feel better that the people beneath us had it harder or we had it harder than that. Like we keep playing that division game. The division game is removing yourself from the world. It's egotistical. We have to stop removing ourselves in the world. We have to start being a part of the world. Did you really want to grow up in the situation you grew up in? Like, yeah, I know I say it's a great thing that happened to me that I was, you know, homeless and that like I grew up poor. Because that was the only way to counteract all of the other terrible shit. We just keep counteracting more terrible shit with other terrible shit. That is a methodology of balance, but it only leans one way. So it's not balanced overall. So that's where my statement about like my personal opinion and Maybe I'm not allowed to weigh in on it. I have no idea. I, I honestly have no idea at this point. But, like, we just need to stop teaching it. And at the same time you start stop teaching it, you need to start going the opposite direction and saying, no, 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 no. You are choosing not to be a part of society. Bye-bye. Like, you got to go sit in a corner until you figure this shit out. Because, like, until then, no one should do business with you. No one should, you know, that's how that should happen. But with that, you can't have like, you can't have falsity. And this is where I'm bringing this into the conversation here at the end because it's the challenge overall. This is the challenge to the ego. You can't lie to yourself. Because as much as, yes, the answer might be to like, just eliminate it from the conversation. Just, you know, if we just stop talking about these things, if we stop teaching these things, they will eventually go away. You can't keep bringing them up in false narrative. That goes back to the virtue signaling thing. That goes back to the ego statement of you can't take yourself out of the world. At the same time, you can't lie to yourself in this stuff. Like I'm hitting this point with this whole idea of spirituality where you hit into this idea of you can't lie to yourself. You can't. You can't do it. And lying to someone else is lying to yourself. You're part of that. That's your ego. So you get into attention to actions, attention to all of these things. So the conversation here is to be attentive to your journey. When we look at the question of if you take yourself out of the equation, what is, does the world, like, does your world change? If you eliminate yourself from that, does your world change? If the answer is no, you can't lie to yourself about why. Because that's a spiritual question. And if it's because you're not happy with yourself, if it's because you're any number of reasons, I, I don't know you personally nor can I fully because of my standard of depression and that understanding. I can ask the questions though, to get you to that point. Cause here's the next question then. Right. So if the answer is like, why? And like, you don't have an answer. If the answer is there's no answer, which I, I, I I'm okay with that statement. The answer is there's no answer. You also have to answer. You have to not lie to yourself about, Oh, well it doesn't have to be this way. That's the, that's the greatest lie is that, no, it has to be this way. That's what I talk about, about how creation's not the first point on the map in the story on the, no, it's chaos, infinite possibility. That's the first, it's infinitely possible. That's chaos. That's where everything starts. That's why I, I I'm just over and over again about that because 
when you have these tough conversations, you also have to not lie to yourself about like, no, like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this way. You can be, ha- you get to be the happy, you, you get to be content, you get to whatever it works for you. I get stuck in the, the vocabulary there because I'm, I don't really do the happy thing. So I try to make it a proper statement for myself, but like, it doesn't have to be that way. That's not whoever told you that, whoever, why you believe that I have no idea, but like, that's not true. So you can't lie to yourself there. That's also what these cards are talking about that I picked today. That's why I, overall I had like all of these different ideas, but like I settled with ego because the full card came up and I wanted it to be about a personal realization. And part of it comes down to you can't, there's no lying there. You can't lie about that. You can't tell yourself like, oh, it's always going to be this way. That's not true. Because you don't know. Which means anything's possible. The truest story of the ego is that anything is possible. Anything and everything is possible when it comes to ego. Because as much as we are a part of the world, the world is a part of us. We are our own world. We are our own trinity. We are a principal idea of this world. We have to be here for something, right? That's that's been one of the greatest questions ever asked by humanity. What is our reason for being? Why are we here? To experience. That is the most simplistic answer I can give you. Is to experience. The why of the experience, that's a spiritual question. You have to answer that one for yourself. You got to figure out what your spirituality is. But you are a physical body experiencing things, doing chemical reactions. You are an omnipotent presence as a psyche of a mind, of an ego, a depression over that physical body. You are experiencing. From the very beginning, you are experiencing. So the answer to the question is what we do. We experience. The ego experiences itself and the world around it. The journey of the fool. The why has always been the wrong question. I'm sorry. The why is the right question, but we didn't lead with, we didn't lead with the understanding of it. Uh, This gets into Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, answers 42. You know, what is the reason for to experience? Because it's not the actual answer. It's what we do. So like, what we do is experience. We experience our bodies. We experience food. We experience each other. We experience a breeze, grass, sights, sounds, senses. We experience mysteries and all stories and narratives. And we experience podcasts and we experience all of these things. So the action, the answer is we experience. That's, that's what we're here to do. We are here to experience. The why is to understand the experience. That's ego. That's why it can't just be one of the pieces. It has to be all three of the pieces because that's what gives us the ability to make that representation of what, who, where, when, how, and why. You are here to experience. Everyone is here to experience. The reason for that is individual to you. It's your depression. It's your ego. It's your I. And I'm here to tell you. It's not more important. It's not less important than anyone else. It's just important or we wouldn't be here to begin with. Our existence to me personally is predicated on the idea that we must experience. Thus the importance in measurement to one or another or in between is a self-servant subjective rationalization of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Thus it's conversation. It's just a conversation. It has nothing to do with the fact that we are here to experience. And the why 
is the experience. So it is fucking preposterous to say any one life has a greater representation than another. Because they are experiencing each other. And thus these divisional lines that have been drawn all across the globe and in the sand and in the dirt and in our psyches and our bodies and our spiritualities are preposterous. Unruly, ridiculous. Unfathomable. Stupid. Not principle. These divisional lines are meaningless outside of the idea of the experience. Do I believe they'll ever go away? Me personally, I don't, unfortunately. I wish they would. It'd be nice. The problem with that is someone might feel belittled by the point that I try to eliminate these things. And I have to, I have to understand that in some way. I have to at least include it in my thought process. And it becomes this mind boggling circle of trying to make everyone else feel included. And unfortunately the answer is there's no answer because I rarely put because it's on something. So this is my because moment. The answer is there's no answer in the world of experience because your depression is your depression. It's uniquely who you are and I can't understand it. Nor can you understand mine. So we must stop expecting each other to do so. What we can do instead is try. Absolutely. We can try. Knowing will ultimately fail, which is the definition of unconditional love. And thus, we can individually and collectively start to answer why questions. We can be people of spirituality. Unfortunately, that looks differently for everyone. So again, the answer is there's no answer. Revolving circle. The answer is no, there's no answer. We have to come back to what we're here to do. We are here to experience. So when the answer is there's no answer, and you can't answer my questions about, well, if I eliminate myself from the world... And it doesn't look any different. Maybe I'm just, you know, useless and, or, oh, they're prettier than me. And, oh, this, that, or the, the other. You have to go back to the beginning of the fool's journey. The answer is to experience. So even though the answer is there's no answer, there is an answer. And that answer is to experience. Go back to step one. Go back to go. Don't collect, you know, $200. Go back to the start. Experience. just have to continue to experience. So I guess ultimately that's my challenge for you for this episode is to go experience, go do, go, go do nothing. Experience what nothing feels like. Um, experience what exhaustion feels like. Experience what hunger feels like. These are the, so Maybe I'll get into it in another episode, although I, I, I like doing this uh, tarot card thing, but maybe experience would be a good episode to do. Um, it's possible to try to understand someone else's depression, although ultimately failing, again, unconditional love, by trying to experience what they go through. This is the statement of walk a mile in someone else's shoes or walk 100 miles, whatever the, the saying is. That's That's... The, the the way we put these things are complicated sometimes, but this is, these are the meanings behind them. So 
please go experience. Um, you might choose to experience the Taming Hindrances podcast over at taminghindrances.com. Uh, go over to the archive, check out some stuff on the archive. Um, maybe experience pre. Oh, this sounds. This is horrible. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this. Uh, this method. Um, try experiencing purebulk.com at www. Uh, www. That doesn't even exist anymore. HTTPS colon slash slash uh, purebulk.com. Use taming hindrances code as a coupon code for ten percent off. I get a small commission. It helps out the podcast. Um, proud to be an affiliate of theirs. What else? That's it. Just go experience some stuff and I will uh, maybe have an experience episode for you or we'll leave it up to the cards. Who knows? I like experiencing the cards. We'll probably leave it up to them again, but thank you as always. And um, I'll talk to you in the next one. Thanks for listening. Come check us out at taminghindrances.com for show notes, links, resources, and more.